I didn't have a job. My girlfriend, now wife, was working, and I had one thing that I had as a responsibility every day, and that was to make her a sandwich before she came home for her lunch break. And the only thing that would get me out of bed, 15 years before I'm capable of building a billion dollar company, the only thing that got me out of bed was shame. What is up? Wow, very kind, very, very kind. It is super surreal to have literally just stepped out of the car about seven minutes ago uh, and then to be on stage and with that energy, that's incredible. And I have to say, Vision, the, the community that you put together is really unrivaled. It's, it's really pretty extraordinary. So I'm honored to be, nice. I am very honored to be a part of it. So thank you guys so much. The thing that I find most interesting and the thing that I think a lot about is who are we sort of at our core? What are we? Are we changeable? Are we malleable? The whole nature versus nurture thing has really come to define my life. And whenever I give a business talk, the first question I ask is how many born entrepreneurs we have in the crowd? And normally people get all amped up and they're hyped and they're yelling and screaming because they think that that's somehow a better state of being, to have been born something than to have made yourself. But my thesis in life is it doesn't matter who you are today. It certainly doesn't matter how you were born. The only thing that matters is who you want to become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. Now, I think that Ray Dalio, the um, guy that created Bridgewater, which is the largest hedge fund ever, has been a truly um, just wildly successful person, said it best. I don't know that the life that I have lived is better than somebody who wanted to live a stress-free, quiet life. I only know it's the only life I could have lived. And that's how I feel about the pursuit of greatness. What I'm going to talk about up here is that. I'm going to talk about wanting to become extraordinary, to transform yourself into something that is truly undeniable, to become so good that they can't ignore you. And that has been truly what I've tried to do with my life. But I don't prescribe it for everybody. I'm not saying that this is the only way to live your life. I'm just saying it's the only way that I could have lived mine. Now, the irony is I start about as far from pursuing greatness as you're ever going to get. And my parents taught me to be a good employee, to keep my head down, do as little work as possible, and avoid punishment at all costs. <laughs> and that, that was real. That was my existence. I cheated my way through high school because I knew that I needed to get good grades, but I didn't want to put in the work. I went into the workforce. My dad thought for sure that Having me do essentially menial labor jobs would teach me that I didn't want to do that, but it also made me sort of numb to that kind of work. And so I worked in a paint factory, I worked in a door factory, I worked in a paint warehouse, a paint store. My dad happened to work in a, for a paint company, hence the theme. And I was too lazy to go get a different job. And so I literally just always took whatever was before me. But I had this sense that I could do more, that I could be more, that there was something that I was meant to do. I didn't know what that was exactly. I had a love for filmmaking to be sure, and I've had that love since I was a little kid, but I had no idea how that was going to play itself out. Now, the irony of my life is when I went to leave for college, I almost chickened out. In fact, I did chicken out, and the only reason that I ended up going to college was my mom forced me to. And I was having this moment of crisis. There was only me and one other kid that was leaving the state from my high school. Everybody else went to a state school. Everybody stayed together. It was that familiarity and living essentially a small life. And it sounded really enticing at the prospect that I was about to move away. And so I said to my mom, you know what? Look, let's just forget all this. Let's call it off. It's going to be really expensive. I'll just stay here. And my mom was like, over my dead body. And she pushed so hard to get me out. But then every day since then, my mom has tried to get me back. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? Like, you're the reason I left. <laughs> I never would have left if it wasn't for you. So I literally don't understand. And in that moment, my mom gave me the greatest gift anyone could have ever given me. Because my mom 
supported me. She was my biggest cheerleader. But when I asked her why she pushed me so hard to leave for college, her answer, totally without malice, was I always assumed you were going to fail. You didn't have the drive. She was like, you were so lazy in high school. But I didn't want you to live a life of what if. I didn't want you to wonder what your life would have been like if you had at least tried. But you didn't show any signs of being capable of doing what you've gone on to be capable of doing. Flash forward a few years. I go to the man who would become my father-in-law, and I ask for his blessing to marry his daughter. And he said no. <laughs> now here's the thing. He did not misidentify me. <laughs> he was very right to be concerned. <laughs> but I remember him asking me a simple question. Tom, how do you plan to take care of my daughter? He had come from this very small village in Cyprus. He is one of the most extraordinary tales of rags to riches I've ever heard in my life. As a kid, he would eat meat once a year because that was all they could afford. I've been to the village that he grew up in, and when I say village, I mean village. This shit is crazy. It is like a couple hovels in the middle of absolutely nowhere after you drive on this death-defying road for like an hour in the mountains. It was bananas. And I was like, how does somebody come from this and then run one of the largest shipping companies in the world? And he just worked his way up and he was so disciplined. And he started as basically an errand boy. Then he moved into the accounting department. And then at like 19, they fired the, account, the entire accounting department except for him because he was the only one that could balance the books. Now that becomes a theme in my life, that skills have utility. They let you do something. Because he understood math in a way that other people didn't, he could do something other people couldn't do. Now this is where he comes from, that he worked his way from ground fucking zero, man, a dirt patch in the middle of nowhere to living in London and running one of the largest shipping companies from a high rise. It's this extraordinary tale of transformation. And so he's looking at me, a young 20 something kid. And when he says, how do you plan to take care of my daughter? My answer is, sir, I know what you see before you is a broke, undereducated kid but I'm the most ambitious person you've ever met. Now, if this were a really cool story, in that moment he would be won over and everything would be magical, but let me tell you, he was skeptical. And the reason he was skeptical, and let this sink in, this is about 15 years before I build a billion dollar company. I would lay in bed for up to four hours a day, every single day, because I couldn't motivate myself to get out of bed. I didn't have a job. My girlfriend, now wife, was working, and I had one thing that I had as a responsibility every day, and that was to make her a sandwich before she came home for her lunch break. And the only thing that would get me out of bed, 15 years before I'm capable of building a billion dollar company, the only thing that got me out of bed was shame. So you have to understand that people had not misidentified me. This is not a story of someone who was born extraordinary. People just couldn't see it, that I was secretly this amazing person who was just waiting for their opportunity to shine. This was somebody who was lazy as fuck, had no idea what they were going to do with their life. I had no idea how I was going to pull it off. I was absolutely terrified. Every time I looked in the mirror, I saw me staring back, and I knew how lazy I was. I knew how afraid I was. I knew how insecure I was. I knew that at my core, I wanted people to like me, and I was terrified that they had every reason in the world not to like me. But instead of becoming someone who was worthy of self-respect, who was worthy of their respect, all I was trying to do was campaign. I was trying to posture. I was trying to create the illusion that I was something because that seemed like I could do it fast instead of just buckling down and doing the hard ass work of becoming somebody new. Because I had one failed misunderstanding. I believed that my talent and intelligence were fixed traits. I was born a certain way and life was about making the most of what I'd been born with. What I did not yet understand is the reason humans are the ultimate apex predator, 
the reason that we have taken over the globe in a way that no other species has is because we are the ultimate adaptation machine. Darwin is often misquoted as saying it's the strongest of the species that survived. He did not say that. What he said was it's neither the strongest of the species that survived nor the most intelligent, but rather the most adaptive to change. It is the animal that can change the fastest to a changing environment that becomes the most dominant species the world has ever seen. It is our very nature to change. That is what we are wired to do. If you look at human DNA, we have roughly 20,000 genes that encode traits. There are onions with 40,000 genes. <laughs> Think about that. Are you really less biologically complicated than an onion? <laughs> I would say probably not. But that's the reality of us at a DNA level. And for a long time, scientists disregarded all of the other, what they called junk DNA, that didn't encode for traits. But what we now know that junk DNA is, is epigenetic signaling. It is the thing that makes us extraordinary. It's the thing that says, ah, in this environment, respond like this. So you can go to the gym and bust your ass and train your body and change your physique. And we've all seen it happen with bodybuilders. We all get that they came out of the womb weak, just like everybody else. And they put themselves under an ungodly amount of stress and strain. And they push themselves every day. And they had this just unimaginable amount of discipline. And from that, they are able to transform themselves into somebody completely unrecognizable. It's it is amazing. And because it happens on the outside, we all get it. We all believe in it. We look at athletes and we understand that they work their way there. But we don't look at Gary Kasparov and realize he did the same thing. Because what's happening in the mind seems invisible. We can't see it. We don't understand what's happening. And so as shame was the only thing that would drag me out of bed, I didn't understand that the same thing I believed to be true of my body was true of my mind. But thank God... I was sliding towards depression. Because in sliding towards depression, I didn't want to feel that way anymore. I didn't want to be ashamed when my girlfriend came home and I had gotten out of bed just moments before in a panic. I didn't want to have the conversation anymore where my girlfriend had to pull me aside and say, it's not cool that you're wearing your pajamas all day. It's not cool that you never do your hair. And I began to make a choice. And that choice was, at that time, there was a hot debate going on as to whether or not the brain was truly plastic. Now, this seems self-evident now because people talk about it all the time, but back then it was actually a debate. Were you born with a certain number of neurons and that was all you were going to have, and at the end of your life, you were only going to be declining, 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 or could you actually learn new things? When I was a kid, the adage, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, was like, everyone just believed it. But because of that, I found myself putting myself in smaller and smaller rooms because, and this is going to be the most important thing that I say today, of this I assure you, what you build your self-esteem around matters. And whether you realize it or not, each and every one of you has something that sits at the core of how you feel about yourself. And from that, your identity, your sense of self-worth, your self-esteem, it is all built around that thing. And I will tell you the trap that most people fall into, that I certainly fell into, that led me into hiding in bed for five hours at a time every morning, was that I valued myself for being smart, for being right, for being good, for being worthy, all incredibly fragile traits. And I kept encountering people who were smarter than I was, who were right more than I was. And it made me feel badly about myself. Now, if there's anything you know, you know it's a human's move towards the things that make them feel good, and they move away from the things that make them feel bad. So you can understand that is a terrible strategy to have this very fragile thing that holds my entire sense of identity and self-worth. I'm smart. I meet somebody smarter than me, and I don't think, what can I learn? Because I think an old dog can't learn new tricks. This isn't about pushing myself and changing my mind the way that I can change my body. This is about fucking survival, emotional survival, and getting into the psychological immune system. The psychological immune system is powerful, and they found, this freaks me out, but you're going to love it. The more delusional a person is, the happier they are. <laughs> that shit is real. And we all have that one crazy friend who you're like, Damn. 
but they look like they're having a great time. So I'm not saying that it's not powerful. I'm just saying it's not going to help you live an extraordinary life. Why? Because if you want to do something extraordinary, you have one job. Leave your fellow humans in awe. Now, when you think about, holy shit, my job as a parent, as an entrepreneur, as an athlete, as a speaker, as a whatever you want to be, you've got to get so good at that thing that when people see you do it, you make them experience the most potent human emotion, and that is awe. To get that good is a terrifying journey of self-discovery and confronting who you really are because you cannot make change until you acknowledge where you're actually at. Now, why? Because it's not some new age woo thing. It is for real. Like, if you understand where you're weak, then you know where to spend your time building skills. To me, the gap between where you are now and where you want to go is a gap of skill set. And once I realized that, and I made the choice to believe that this whole brain plasticity thing was real, even though it was being hotly debated, then I could shift my self-esteem from being smart, right, good, worthy, to being that of the learner. The learner is the only identity that I have ever found that is anti-fragile. As Nassim Taleb says, things that are robust, that are strong, that are tough, that can take just a lot of abuse before they break, they are still ultimately defined by their breaking point. Something that is anti-fragile, on the other hand, is something that the more you attack it, the more it is pounded on, the stronger it gets. Now imagine being able to build a belief system, the thing that you build your self-esteem around, if all of that were tied to something that is truly anti-fragile, that the more somebody comes after it, the more robust it becomes, being a learner is that answer. Think about it. If somebody is going to come after you and they want to hurt your feelings, there is one thing every time they will reach for. That is something that is true. When people try to hurt you, they go for the most real thing and they fucking jab you right in your heart because they know it's going to hurt because it's real, man. And that's mean for sure and it hurts for sure. But if you think of it like this, when somebody's throwing a rock at you with the intention of hurting you, you can put your defenses up, you will deflect that rock, never to be seen again, or you can lower your defenses, let it hit you in the face, knowing that it will hurt, but also knowing now at your feet is not a rock, it's a lump of gold. Because they've given you an insight into where you are weak. Now, once you know where you are weak, you can begin to build yourself. And that is my thesis on life. You get to build yourself in any direction you want, in any way, to become anything you want. There will be an extraordinary price to pay. But you can go in any direction. Now, I don't think that we're born blank slates. But we are so close to that. To worry about where your limits are is to miss how much you can improve. So focus on how much you can improve. There's an amazing quote by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the author of the Gulag Archipelago. And what he said was, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. To me, it's not about good and evil. To me, it's about malleability. That's a statement of how shapeable we are. Now, here's the terrifying thing about how we get shaped. It happens when you're young. You get all these things that come to you that seem to be simply true. I believed that the human mind couldn't change. I believed that it was fixed. I believed that my talent and intelligence were just what they were. It all seemed true. 
It wasn't like I knew it to be a lie. It wasn't even like I knew that I had a choice to think of it a different way. And one of my favorite quotes of all time is from Albert Einstein. And he said, the most important decision any human being has to make is whether they live in a friendly or a hostile universe. Decision. The most important decision anyone has to make. Because neither of those two states is empirically true, but either will immediately appear true once you decide to believe it. So once you decide to believe, yo, the world is working for me, this shit is happening for me, it's not happening to me, I know this room has heard that statement. <laughs> once you believe that, you start looking for the ways in which that was powerful. How is the worst thing that ever happened to me actually secretly the best thing that's ever happened to me? And so suddenly I started saying, how is this shame of sitting in bed, how is this the best thing that's ever happened to me? How is this soliary type awareness of just how dumb I really am. How is that powerful? And the thing that winds me up, when I say that, when I talk about I started from not being that bright, nobody thought I was gonna win, my own mother thought I was gonna fail, my father-in-law did not want me to marry his daughter, they think that I'm just being humble or that even I misidentified myself. But the reality is that's how shapeable a human being is. And I had made decisions, I had chosen to believe things, I had chosen to value myself for things, I had built myself around, my self-esteem around things that were not moving me forward. And so I began to change my belief system. I began to change the things that I value. And think about values. Think about how much they shape your life. Depending on where you grow up, you could become one of the members of the tribe on North Sentinel Island who killed that missionary who rolled up on their beaches, they just started hitting that fool with spears and arrows and just fucking killed him. You could be that. You could be a warrior of Sparta. You could be a Nazi guard. Depending on the time and the place you grew up in, you could be a Manhattan socialite. You could be a party girl. You could be one of any countless identities that we see in the world. Not because you were born to be that thing, if we were born to be something, then we would still see some percentage of Spartan warriors being born today. We would see North Sentinelese born in Omaha, Nebraska. But we don't, because each of these places carries with it a value system, a belief system, things that are unique to that group that you grow up in, what your parents tell you about your family, about you, what it means to be you, what you learn in schools, what you see in the media, all of that stuff is shaping how you view yourself and how you view the world, but it's happening insidious, insidiously because it is so invisible. People don't realize that they are choices. Now, once you reframe all of this, these are things that I'm choosing to believe. And once you realize that you can choose to believe something new and thusly get a different result, everything changes. And that's where you begin to build yourself. Now, building yourself begins with intention, clarity. You have to know who you want to become. You can't just show up in the gym of the mind and do random stuff any more than you can show up in the gym of the body and do random stuff and think that you're gonna end up on the stage competing for Mr. Olympia. It doesn't work like that. You've gotta have this clarity of focus. And the way that I always explain it to people, people come to me all the time and they're like, Tom, I wanna help people, man. And I'm like, that is rad. That's coming from such a beautiful place. But telling me that you want to help somebody is like saying you want to win a gold medal. In what? The Olympics? Yes, fantastic. Summer or winter? Summer, great. Tennis or swimming? Swimming? Which event? Backstroke? The medley? Because until you know exactly in what way you are trying to serve people, you don't know what skills you need to acquire in order to leave people in awe so that you may become extraordinary. <laughs> skills have utility. Learning how to swim better makes you a faster swimmer. Building certain muscles in your arms and in your shoulders, um, all of the different things that go into getting great at any sport, all of those things must be learned with calculation. They must be practiced and rehearsed over and over and over. You have to push yourself long past the point of boredom. Boredom kills more people in the pursuit of success than any hater will ever kill. <laughs> boredom is the great killer of dreams. 
boredom. Because people don't have the focus, they don't have the clarity of what they're trying to achieve, they have not built into their life, built into their life an intoxication for what they're trying to accomplish. I used to big brother for a kid named Rashawn. I failed Rashawn. I spent eight and a half years with him. I didn't realize that he was being beaten by his adoptive mother. I didn't save him from a life of poverty. I wasn't able to change his mindset. And I have to face that. I have to accept that I had a moment, I had a chance to change somebody's life and I failed. But once I own that, I can begin to realize why I failed. It's not a mistake that the company that I'm building now is all about transmitting mindset at scale because I'm thinking of Rashawn. So at moments, at moments where I'm bone tired, I have that clarity. And when you have the clarity and you know where you're trying to go, then it becomes clear about what you have to train at. What are the things that you have to train into yourself? But the only way to do that is to have a self-esteem that's built entirely around being the learner. Why? Because you get the shot to the head, the nugget of gold at your feet. It says, you suck at this. That hurts, man. That's hard to own. It's hard to face. And there's a thousand voices in your mind telling you all the reasons why it's somebody else's fault and it's not your fault. But the reality is the moment you do that, you're giving away your power because you're not looking for a way to change. You're not looking for a way to shape your skill set. Remember, between where you are and where you want to go, it is a gap of skill set. Now, I'm not a born entrepreneur. I don't have any entrepreneurial instincts by birth. When I first got involved in business, I remember my only contributions to our conference calls. You're going to think I'm kidding, and this is unfortunately very true. The only contribution I would make to a conference call was to say goodbye. And I remember I used to get so excited. Here it comes. We're wrapping up. This is going to be amazing. It's my chance. Goodbye. <laughs> and I finally, I got to say something. But at that time, I just needed to learn. I needed to pay attention. I needed to see where I was weak. And the constant barrage on my self-esteem that I wasn't the smartest person in the room, that I wasn't right very often, it was unrelenting. And I remember saying to myself, all right, man, you got two choices. You can leave. Like, you don't need to be here. You don't need to want to become an entrepreneur. That doesn't have to be your life. You can go back to selling video games, which is what I was doing. You can go back to selling video games. You could go back to teaching. Like, if that's where you're going to be happy, then go do that. But if you really want to become extraordinary, you've got to separate your self-esteem from being wrong. You have to. Because otherwise, you're never going to see the opportunity to get better. And so I decided that I was going to start valuing myself. My entire value was going to be predicated on being willing to admit that I was wrong, on being willing to stare nakedly at my inadequacies. I was not going to hide from them. I was not going to run. I wasn't going to try to do some fancy story. I was just going to own it. Yo, you suck at this, man. You suck at this, but... You're just not good at it yet. And once that word yet is lingering out there, suddenly it becomes a question of time allocation. So you know you could get good at it, but it's going to take a lot of time and energy. So what are the skills that you really want to get good at? And that goes back to that clarity. What do I need to get good at in order to accomplish the things that I want to accomplish? It does not need to be something that somebody else values. It needs to be the thing I have chosen to value that I have built into my life, this worship around getting good at that thing. I didn't have to get good at helping others build mindset. That didn't have to be my life. But that's what I've chosen. That's what I want to do. And so I build this tremendous amount of value into it. And because I value myself for pursuing that, and I value myself for admitting when I'm wrong, and I value myself for staring nakedly at my inadequacies, every fucking day, I'm getting better. But I'm begging you. I am begging you with everything I have. Remember that just 15 years earlier, I got out of bed solely out of shame. My mother thought I was going to fail. My father-in-law did not want me to marry his daughter. Brick by brick, day after day, 
I transformed myself. It was not an uncovering of something that was real and already there. It was simply acknowledging I am a hopelessly average human, but humans are the ultimate adaptation machine. So I can change. I can become whatever I want. And I just became single-mindedly focused on how much I could grow. And now that I was getting value and self-esteem out of growing instead of out of being, everything in my life changed. So 15 years later, my father-in-law visits the U.S. for the first time since we started Quest. And I'm taking him around the production floor. And there's... 300,000 square feet, there's 800 employees, the bars are coming off the line at 1.5 million a day, people are coming up and thanking me for having a job and for the way that we run the company and all that. And I turned to him and I said, Andreas, do you remember asking me how I was going to take care of your daughter? And he said, yes. And I said, how am I doing? And he just burst into tears. And the punchline of that story it does not matter who you are today. The only thing that matters is who you want to become and the price you're willing to pay to get there. Thank you.